Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the third day of uh, exciting Fino meeting. Uh, the first session today will have a variety of topics from neutrino physics to string landscape and future colliders. Uh, the first speaker is uh, Regina Ramika from Fermi National Lab. Uh, she's going to tell us about uh, perspectives on neutrino physics. Uh, Regina, I will give a uh, five minute warning after 25 minutes. So please uh, get started. Okay, thank you. So as you said, my talk title is Perspectives on Neutrino Physics. But I'm gonna make it very specific given the limited time and I'm gonna have it focused on accelerator-based long baseline neutrino experiments. And to get the perspective, I think thinking about this, I decided that to plan where we're going, it's good to see where we've been. So here's the outline of my talk. First, I'm gonna tell you who I am because I'm a little bit out of place in this crowd looking at the agenda. And then I'm gonna give you a little history of neutrinos, focus on accelerator neutrino physics, and then focus further on neutrino oscillations. And then I wanna talk about long baseline experiments with a summary and an outlook. So who am I? I'm an experimental physicist. I've worked at Fermilab for my entire career, starting as a graduate student in 1978. I've been working on neutrino experiments since 1993. Before that, I studied hyperon polarization and magnetic moments. In the early 90s, I worked on the development, operation, and analysis of the Fermilab Minos and Donut experiments. And I've also worked on Nova and Microboon, which you'll hear about some of these. And I'm currently the co-spokesperson of Dune. So let's start with a little history of neutrinos. You probably know this, but it's good to put it in a chronological order so you can see how far we've come. The existence of the neutrino was hypothesized in 1930 as a zero mass elementary particle to conserve the concept of conservation of energy in the beta decay process. The first detection of neutrinos occurred more than 20 years later in the landmark experiment of Rhinus and Colin at the Savannah River Nuclear Power Plant. In 1957, Bruno Pontecorvo hypothesized that neutrinos may oscillate or change from one type to another, although only one type of neutrino had ever been seen. In 1962, a second type or flavor of neutrino was identified in a Brookhaven laboratory experiment led by Letterman, Schwartz, and Steinberger. This was the charge current neutrino interaction, which produced a muon rather than an electron. In 1973, neutral current interactions were detected at CERN by the Gargamel experiment. And in 1975, the first detection of tau leptons at SLAC led to the prediction of a third flavor of neutrino, the tau neutrino. <clears throat> okay, so sorry, had that little redundant there. In 68, neutrinos from the sun were detected in a huge tank of dry cleaning fluid located in the home state gold mine in South Dakota. This team was led by Ray Davis and the detected number of neutrinos was low compared to theoretical predictions. In 1983, studies of atmospheric neutrinos in the Cameo Conde mine and at the IMB detector in the US, those collaborations measured an anomaly in the muon to electron neutrino interaction rates. So something was starting to look a little funny in these neutrinos, which seemed very simple. Things began to come together in 1998 when the Super Cameo Kande experiment in Japan determined that atmospheric muon neutrinos were disappearing as they traveled from their production point to their interaction point. And as predicted by Pontegorbo more than 20 years earlier, it was determined that these flavor changing neutrinos had mass. The hypothesis was that the muon neutrinos were oscillating to tau neutrinos. How, yeah, however, no one had ever yet detected a tau neutrino interaction. In 2000, scientists from the Donut Collaboration announced the recording of four tau neutrino interactions, and a total of tau nine interactions were published in the final data analysis. In, two, in 2002, the SNOW experiment in Canada announced conclusive evidence that three flavors of solar neutrino had been accounted for. And then finally in 2010, the OPERA experiment at, at, in Gran Sasso, using the same detector technique as the donut experiment, searched for tau neutrino appearance using a neutrino beam from CERN. And in 2015, they announced the detection of five tau neutrino interactions. 
So by now, after many decades, the picture of the neutrino was pretty clear. There were three flavors of neutrino. They interacted via charged current interactions and neutral current interactions. And we know that they're not non-zero, they have a mass. And we know that they're very abundant, but they're hard to detect, but they're abundant. There are neutrinos in the universe all over us. As you know, there are relic neutrinos, high energy neutrinos produced in outer space. The sun emits neutrinos, the atmosphere emits neutrinos, the earth emits neutrinos, there's geoneutrinos, and even everyday things like bananas emit neutrinos. And so they're pretty large component of the matter on earth. They don't exceed dark matter, but they exceed almost everything else. So we do want to detect them. They're hard to detect, but there are many ways to detect neutrinos. Going way back, as I said, at Gargamel, the neutrinos were interacted in, detected in a bubble chamber. We've detected them in emulsion detectors. Because they're hard to detect, large detectors made of iron and scintillator have been used. Phototubes have been buried in the ice at the South Pole. We've used liquid scintillator. We've used liquid argon and huge tanks of water like Super Cameo Conde with phototubes can detect neutrinos. So we have a variety of tools for detecting neutrinos. And what we choose depends on their mass, their energy, where we're looking, and so on. So I want to get into the area of intrigue, the neutrino oscillation, which I just put on this slide, the equations and the matrices and the way that we can formulate how, how to predict what neutrino interactions, how they interact and flavor change and the mixing angles and the phases that go with it. And so these are the, just a compendium of uh, the things that you'll see. I'm going to simplify it a little bit. And I'm going to say what happens in a, just a two flavor approximation. And here what you see is we can write a simple probability of a neutrino A going to a neutrino B in terms of a mixing angle and a mass difference and an experimental parameter, which is the length over which you let the neutrino travel and the energy of the neutrino. And so we make these little plots that show if a neutrino starts out high probability in one flavor, and it travels a distance, it will actually start to change into the other flavor. And this will go on. So that's why it's called neutrino oscillations. Now, it's not as simple as just saying neutrino A goes to neutrino B, because as we know, there are three flavors of neutrinos. So in fact, if we start out with a single flavor of neutrino, it will actually have a probability of turning into one of the other two flavors of neutrinos. And so you get a picture that looks more like this. And we know that because there are three flavors of neutrinos, there are two distinct mass differences. So we, re we represent them in pictures like this, where there's a, a mass splitting between two of them and another mass splitting between the other two. The interesting thing is that the equations that I showed you don't predict actually whether the heaviest neutrino is on the top or the bottom. And so this is where we get into the interesting piece of neutrino oscillation experiments. How can we unravel all of these things, like measure the mass difference, measure the mixing angles, and determine this mass ordering? Well, one of the ways we can do it, as I said, there are many, many sources of neutrinos. And scientists study all of the different types of neutrino sources. But the one I'm going to focus on is the accelerator neutrino which you can create a beam of neutrinos at an accelerator laboratory by taking a high energy beam, hitting a target, producing pions and kaons, focusing the pions and kaons in what we call a magnetic focusing horn, and then let them travel through a long geometry pipe called a decay pipe. And so by the time they get there, the pions and kaons have decayed, we've produced lots of muons, you can absorb the pions and kaons in absorber, and what comes out are neutrinos and muons. And so that's the way we can make a muon neutrino beam, and that's what we do at the accelerator. So here's a picture of the Fermilab accelerator complex, and there are meant, there's the Tevatron ring, there's a main injector ring, there are some low energy extraction rings, and there are the very long beam lines called fixed target beam lines. And I just want to point out that neutrinos have been in the history of 
Fermilab, since its very beginning, the very first experiment approved at Fermilab was called E1A in 1972. And it used a scintillator, an iron calorimeter to detect muon neutrino interactions. And that detector actually remained in operation for decades. And here's a picture of an event that was taken in around 2000. So this is a little the way they used to design beam lines back in the old day, you know, hand drawings and extract the beam this way. And this op accelerator complex is still operating today, producing lots of neutrino beams. And we'll go to a little more detail on that as we go on. So I'm going to switch to saying you're going to hear about experiments now that are long baseline neutrino experiments. And I want to just mention, why do we want to do a long baseline neutrino experiment? Because this neutrino oscillation probability is very complicated. And it gets even more complicated if we let the neutrinos travel through the Earth. When the neutrinos travel through the Earth, there are more factors that go into the oscillation probability that have to do with the density of the Earth and the number of electrons that are encountered by a neutrino as it travels through literally the matter of the Earth. And what it does is it actually moder moderates the oscillation probability in two ways. The probability is a function of the delta CP parameter, which appears in these equations. So the question is, are neutrinos and antineutrinos oscillating in the same way? If they are, then delta CP will just be zero or pi. But if they're not, it's going to be different for neutrinos and antineutrinos. And on top of that, if the ordering is one way or the other, the oscillation probability is affected by the, the mass ordering. So if we do experiments over a long baseline, then we're going to be able to untangle parameters like delta CP and the mass ordering. So this kind of experiment started many a few decades ago, actually, being proposed at Fermilab in the early 1990s and operating in the, in the 2000s. And this was called the MINOS experiment which sent a beam from Fermilab all the way up to Northern Minnesota, um, going through the earth. And this was the first time we'd done an experiment over this long distance. And it was intriguing for people to realize that we weren't building a tunnel from Illinois to Minnesota, but rather shooting a neutrino beam through the earth at the, the deepest part of the beam was 10 kilometers underground. This is just about in the middle of Wisconsin. People used to ask if the cows would be affected. Um, it, was, it was the early days of uh, shooting neutrinos off site. And the reason we, did, we do this is because you measure the neutrinos at Fermilab in a near detector. It looks like a typical neutrino detector, an iron calorimeter, scintillator iron calorimeter. And you measure the beam spectrum there. And we were able to actually vary the neutrino beam, but mostly ran with this beam at a low energy. It was the right energy for the distance that we were going to travel. And then we go up to northern Minnesota and build a detector deep underground in an old iron ore mine and measure the neutrino interactions up there. And if nothing was happening to the neutrinos on, the, on their way there, the spectrum would look like this dotted line. But in fact, what happens when you get there, you measure neutrino interactions and it's, the, it's these dots in the solid black fit. And so this disappearance, this is muon neutrino disappearance, we're able to fit to a delta m squared and find out a little bit about the neutrino oscillation. So we fit a delta m squared in a mixing angle. Now there's no CP violation detected in this experiment because the parameters are just not quite there. And that'll bring us to, as we go on, um, doing more experiments. And so using that same beam from Fermilab going to Northern Minnesota, we actually went a little further north and left a, a built a detector sitting on the ground, not deep underground, um, but this was called the NOVA detector. It was very, very large. It was, it's this length, it's the length of the high-rise at Fermilab and, you know, six stories high. Why so big? Because neutrino interactions are hard to come by. Why does it look like this? It has a cosmic ray interactions happening all over the place because it's on the surface. But believe it or not, you can dig deep like a needle in a haystack and pick out neutrino interactions. And this is a liquid scintillator detector. So it's sensitive to electron neutrinos. 
And so in this detector, we were able to measure the parameter theta 1, 3, the new mu to new E appearance mixing angle. Now, it's funny that about the same time that Fermilab was doing these experiments, the CERN accelerator in Europe also built a neutrino beam and aimed it to the Gran Sasso laboratory deep under a mine in Northern Italy. And the funny thing about this was that the distance or the baseline was the same as the NUMI baseline in, in the US. And so it was an amusing set of experiments that were, being go that were going on. But in this experiment, they were actually searching for the, the dominant component that I mentioned, the new mu to new tau. And two detectors were built to do that. One was the Icarus detector, which is a liquid argon detector. And I'm not going to talk about short baseline physics, but just for information, this detector has been moved from Italy to Fermilab and is now sitting in a neutrino beam at Fermilab, continuing to take data. The other detector that was put in the Grand Sasso laboratory was the OPERA detector, which used the same technique as the donut experiment, and in fact was able to detect tau neutrino events coming from the muon neutrino beam at CERN. So now the circle has been closed. We've detected new mu to new E, new E, new mu to new tau oscillations, and measured lots of parameters, the delta m squareds and the mixing angles. And we're beginning to really understand the neutrino mass mixing matrix. And here's a summary of, to date, the experiments that have done these long baseline experiments. The T2K experiment in Japan is still running, and the NOVA experiment is still running. And so these experiments, along with reactor experiments, which I can't, I'm not talking about today, have contributed to the global knowledge of neutrino mass and mixing parameters. So the results so far, and I've taken this summary from the Particle Data Group 2020, it shows in general the data show consistent results in measuring these mixing angles, theta 1, 3, theta 1, 2, and the two delta m squared. So we only measured the absolute value of the delta m squared because we don't know the ordering of the states. But the issues which still require clarification are the mass ordering, understanding a little bit more about where this theta 2, 3 really lies in the, octa in the space, and the lepton CP phase delta CP. In all of the analysis so far, the best fit is for the normal mass ordering, but is not definitive. Some analyses show preference for the second octant of theta 2, 3, but the statistical significance is below 3 sigma. The best fit in normal ordering is for delta CP not to be 0 or 180, um, but 120 degrees. However, CP conservation is still allowed at a 1 to 2 sigma confidence level. So the significance of CP violation in the global analysis is reduced as well, because these two running experiments, T2K and NOVA, do not show a significant um, uh, a same result. OK, so what's next? We're not done yet with this story. Um, and I want to just briefly talk about the liquid argon detector, which I mentioned ran in the Gran Sasso program. Liquid argon detectors detect, um, they're filled with liquid argon. They, um, as charged particles go through them, they ionize and emit electrons, which drift in the high electric field. They also emit scintillation photons. And so these detectors, by collecting the charge on very sensitive planes, actually give you bubble chamber results, images of neutrino interactions, far better than any of those iron scintillators or even liquid scintillators can detect. So this detector technology has become a highlight in future neutrino oscillations. Uh, this is just a little plot, just if you're interested about how the, uh, um, how the liquid argon detector works and the charge emitted as a function of the electric field and the distance over which you travel. All of these things go into our ability to design the next generation detector, which I'm going to come to in this last part of the talk is what's next is the deep underground neutrino experiment called DUNE. Here, we still use the accelerator beam from Fermilab. However, it's being upgraded to a 1.2 megawatt proton source. We create a neutrino beam and aim it 1,300 kilometers away to a deep underground mine in South Dakota. If I didn't put Stanford Research Lab here, I would have put Homestake Mine, which brings the neutrinos back to the place where the anomalies were first detected in the Davis experiment. So it's sort of a, a nice come around, a closure to the story. 
Um, the mine is located deep underground. It's a mile underground. Excavation of large caverns are being made in order to put large liquid argon detectors. Here, the beam is 20 miles underground um, as it goes through. And the detectors will be almost 17 kilotons each made in big steel cryostats um, with liquid argon detectors in them, which, as I said, make drift volumes for electrons to drift. We have two types of detectors. One is what we call a horizontal drift. So we put a high voltage on the cathode and drift electrons to anode planes. The other is called vertical drift, where we put a big cathode plane in the middle, set it at 300 kilovolts and let the electrons drift up to charge, uh, charge readout planes. So this is the new technology. Oh, it's not new, but it, it, it's not new, but it is being pushed to a scale that is unprecedented. And I want to end by saying Dune is not alone in this search. We have an experiment built on this, the technique that first discovered the atmospheric neutrino oscillations in Super Cameo Conde. Um, this sends a beam from the JPARC accelerator near Tokai over to Super Cameo Conde. You'll see the baseline is much smaller than the US, but the beam energy is much smaller as well. So the L over E's probe a little bit different space, but they're still doing a long baseline experiment. So we have a shorter baseline, a lower energy, and a water trank up technique. They are going to expand the Super K detector by building a new one that's almost 10 times bigger than that, in 20 times bigger in fiducial volume. You can see all neutrino detectors are reaching unprecedented, um, unprecedented size in order to detect, detect these elusive particles. So here's my summary. For the next several years, the NOVA and T2K experiments will continue to make world-class measurements to confirm our understanding of neutrino mass and mixing parameters. The Dune and Hyper-K experiments are being constructed and once operating, will offer unprecedented data sets to refine the parameters. The long baseline of the Dune experiment will enable a definitive measurement of the mass ordering with just a couple of years of operation. The Dune and Hyper-K experiments offer complementary approaches to measuring the challenging parameter of delta CP. And both experiments will also provide laboratories which are sensitive to supernova, solar neutrinos, and nucleon decay. So in my view, the future is bright for neutrino enthusiasts. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Regina, for such a nice overview of the neutrino program. Uh, we do have time for enough time for questions. Please type in your uh, uh, questions if you have any in the Q&A section. I already have received a uh, uh, couple of questions. Uh, let me begin with the first one. Uh, someone wrote this. I have a naive question. How do you reduce the background and uh, interference from outside in such a large baseline experiment? It's a, that's a really good question. And there are two things. One is sometimes we don't reduce the background. Um, as I showed you the NOVA experiment, which sits on the surface, it has cosmic rays all over it. There, one has to use techniques of reconstruction. And this has been done in other experiments where the backgrounds are penetrating particles. And if they, if they traverse the whole detector, you, you literally, you reconstruct them and then you remove them from the data set. And so you look for, you, you, you literally play needle in a haystack and remove the extraneous signals until you are left with what looks um, like the neutrino interaction with coming from a vertex. The other way we do it is by going deep underground. So as I showed you, three experiments that are deep underground. The Gran Sasso experiment was a mile under a mountain. Uh, the Minos experiment was a half a mile underground. And the new experiments in Cameo in, in Japan and Dune are deep underground. And this gives you tremendous reduction of background from cosmic rays and other extraneous signals. And so it's actually a very quiet environment for the events. All right. Remember, we're not, you know, it, it gets harder if we're looking for very, very low energy events. So I didn't go into the story about the supernova events. And they're very tricky. They're very small. 
but a neutrino interaction literally is on the scale of you know centimeters to meters long and so they're easy to see all right thank you uh, another question from yun jiang uh, asking if it is possible to measure delta m squared two three in the future delta m squared delta m squared two three in the future that is what we are we have measured delta m squared two three let me just quickly get to this oh okay we call it delta m squared three two but we have measured these what we just don't know is the ordering of them Okay, so delta m squared two three is actually the larger delta m squared, and delta m squared one two is the smaller delta m squared. So delta m squared two three is that what we call the atmospheric mixing mass, and one two is the solar mixing mass. So solar neutrinos measured this delta m squared, and the atmospheric neutrinos measure this delta m squared. Thank you. Um, let me ask a question. Uh, as a theorist, I see that there is a slight, uh, small tension between uh, the oscillation parameters extracted from T2K and uh, uh, NOAA. Yeah. Uh, could you comment on it? Or is there going to be any a joint analysis? Yes, yeah. yes. And I used to be on the NOVA experiment. I'm not anymore. So I don't have the deep insights into what they're going to be doing. But they have had several. Um, get togethers and joint meetings. And I believe the idea is um, after say the next run, uh, they're both still taking, they have, still have more running time. T2K has an upgrade. Nova is gonna continue to run for at least four more years. And I think the goal is to get together and do joint fits when once the next set of runs are done. Thank you. Good question, yeah. Everybody is looking forward to that. Okay, are there any other questions from the audience? We still have a few minutes, uh, so please feel free to, to type in your question. I'll be, I'm monitoring these that appear on the Q&A section. Oh, okay, so Yun Jiang is uh, clarifying, perhaps the notation is different. I'm asking, uh, can we simultaneously measure three mass differences, including delta m squared one three. Not sure what ah, it, uh, ah. Yeah, maybe for, to that. I see what your question is. Yeah, the difference between delta m squared three two and delta m squared three one uh, I mean, that is a very tiny difference and that would require. Yeah, is it, I, I believe is I, I I'm thinking that the the reactor experiment in Juno in in China is trying to do that, and I've looked at that once, and it's very hard to see that difference. I believe that oscillation is in the pop possibility of the parameters of the experiment, but the ability to actually see the difference, I think, is very hard. But I think that's the goal of that, one of their goals. So there's a whole set of you know, neutrino experiments um, that are done at reactors that have contributed immensely to these uh, knowledge, the, the mixing numbers and um, mixing angles. So that's another whole thing that's a low, low energy, short baseline reactor experiments. Um, and then they extend to even long, they, they have long baselines too, but they're not so long. <laughs> like maybe a kilometer away from the source. And the other thing I didn't mention much anything about was the short baseline program, which is done over like a length of a kilometer looking for sterile neutrinos. Um, so it's sort of a fourth neutrino state above these three. Um, and that search is going on in a number of experiments. Could you comment on the timeline for uh or say verifying the mini boon or LSND anomaly with this uh, that's short what baseline. The sh yeah, that's the short baseline program at Fermilab, which is um, starting to run in that the Icarus detector, which is their FAR detector, is 
now operating, but their near detector is still about a year away from being completed to operate. The beam works, the FAR detector is in place, uh, but you definitely need a near detector to do that search and to confirm or deny the LSNTE mini boon anomalies. The micro boon experiment is running, but it's a single, um, single detector experiment at the moment. I mean, yeah. And they're, they're on the verge of publishing their first results from of the search for the mini boon anomaly. So that, that should be soon. And the other program will run for a couple of years and try to be definitive. All right, so it looks like there are no further questions from the audience. So um, thank you very much for, uh, for an excellent talk.